When dealing with a falsehood, you're faced with two options. You can accept it or you can reject it. The basis upon which we take one of these actions is a product of our critical thinking capabilities and a desire to know what is true instead of confirming our bias. A lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is still putting on its shoes. On Brainstorm, we choose the hard truths over the comforting lies. Reason, compassion, skepticism, this is the Brainstorm Podcast. Hi, folks. (laughs) This is take number four or something, because this is a topic that deserves commentary. I I should have something to say about this. This interview is with David Nywart, the author of Alt America, The Rise of the Radical Right in Trump's America. And this is a subject that I have. I think seen coming for a long time. I've been watching for a long time and I've been, I think, I think I've been following the right people because I, I, there are a lot of people who are seeing the danger where it actually is. And when you're complaining about college kids, instead of being afraid of people sending pipe bombs or worrying about people sending pipe bombs to political figures or, shooting up a synagogue and killing multiple people. I think your priorities are screwed up. And I I think that we have a lot of people who are focusing in the wrong direction and complaining about the, the left. They're complaining about people that are ideologically different from them instead of focusing on people who are actually going to kill others. Disagreeing with the right isn't about <clears throat> ideology. It's about safety. It's about wanting people to be safe. I again, I'm going off on a long, on a rant. I don't want to do that. I want to introduce the interview. This is my interview with David Nywert. Um, I hope you enjoy it. If you like what we're doing and want to help us keep the lights on, go become a patron at patreon.com forward slash brainstorm podcast. You can hear the bonus half hour that we record every episode and get a shout out when you support the show. Become a patron for just a dollar an episode at patreon.com forward slash brainstorm podcast. Or you can support the show by ordering a t-shirt, mug or other gear from our store at cafepress.ca forward slash brainstorm podcast gear. If you can't afford to become a patron or buy gear, then why not give us a rating or write a review on iTunes or Stitcher? Every rating makes it easier for people to find us. Thanks for your support. Okay, so uh, welcome to the Brainstorm Podcast, Skeptic Studio. Uh, Today I'm talking to David Nywart. (laughs) I probably wrecked that even though you just told me. (laughs) No, you got it right. Okay, good. Um, uh, You recently, or I guess a little while ago, wrote a book called Alt-America, The Rise of the Radical Right. And I'm, I'm in the middle of it, and it seems a bit uh, prescient, like uh, (laughs) almost like a fortune teller. Uh, (laughs) But uh, I guess to start off, why don't we get a little bit of your background and a little information about you and how you started writing about the radical right? Oh, sure. Uh, Well, it really goes back to the very beginnings of my career as a newspaper man in Idaho uh, this is in the late seventies. Uh, I was going to college at University of Idaho and I got hired by the little paper up in Sandpoint, um, Idaho, which is in the panhandle, uh, to go over there and, and, uh, actually I got hired as a sports writer first and then became a news writer. 
And uh, by uh, about a year later, I became the paper's editor. And uh, we this is at the time that the Aryan Nations was moving into the Idaho Panhandle. And um, they were about 20 miles down the road from us. And okay. uh, we did, uh, we wound up having a lot of that stuff happening in our backyard. Um, and I used to get letters to the editor from Robert Matthews, the guy who was the leader of the order. I don't know if you've ever heard of the order. Uh, uh, maybe in case the listeners don't know who that is. Sure. This is a neo-Nazi criminal gang that came out of the Aryan Nations back in 1984 and uh, did a nationwide uh, criminal rampage, uh, robbed um, about 28 banks and armored cars, uh, and wow. uh, assassinated a radio talk show host named Alan Berg uh, outside of his home in Denver. Um, oh, no. Yeah. And um, the members of that gang all uh, wound up going to prison. Either uh, one of, of course, the leader, Matthews, the guy that I told you I get, got letters to the editor from, was uh, uh, wound up dying in a standoff with the FBI on Whidbey Island, Washington. Uh, but, uh, the rest of them all wound up, uh, in prison, pretty much dying in prison. Most of them have, a number of them have passed away, uh, including a guy named David Lane, who, uh, is a, uh, who wrote, uh, prodigiously from prison in, and wrote a bunch of neo Nazi, uh, propaganda from prison, including the, Credo that became known as the the neo the neo Nazi credo known as the fourteen words, which is oh yeah yeah, and that was written by a member of the order. So anyway, okay. um, so the, these guys were always in my background, um, you know, because even after the order, we we kept having this uh, uh, pattern of criminality coming out of uh, uh, the Aryan nations uh, into the nineties. Okay, and. Uh, including a plot to bomb a gay bar in Seattle back in 91. Um, but, um, and by then I had, had moved to Seattle, uh, from Montana. So, um, and I, I started writing about these militias that were organizing in the Northwest, uh, in about 94. Um, and then after Oklahoma City happened, I was actually an environmental reporter <laughs> as, uh, sort of my line of work. Uh, but uh, I started writing about these militiamen uh, as an anti-environmental backlash story. And okay. uh, and then when uh, Oklahoma City happened, it turned out I was one of the only reporters who had actually gone out and talked to these guys. So I became a militia expert, air quotes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, over the years, I wound up having just a lot of that kind of work, uh, a lot more of that kind of work, uh, and I did indeed develop some actual expertise in the subject. So, um, and including a lot of writing about domestic terrorism, uh, and um, worked at MSNBC in its uh, in its web newsroom in its uh, early years from '96 to 2000, um, and. Uh, then became a stay-at-home dad for 10 years. <laughs> oh, wow. And started writing from home. Uh, and um, uh, that's when I started really freelancing a lot. And uh, Okay. Ran, I ran a couple of blogs, uh, most notably uh, the political blog Crooks and Liars. I was their managing okay, editor yeah. for several years. And... Um, and then uh, got hired by uh, SPLC in 2013 to to write for them. I, I had a long running relationship with folks at SPLC, so um, it was a pretty natural fit. I suppose uh, people who folk or pay attention to radical groups probably uh, kind of associate to some degree. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, there certainly is. It became you know. Um, Boy, by, you know, mid 2000s, you know, or, you know, 2005 and thereabouts, or really by 2001, writing about the radical right had become a very specialized field. And there were only a few of us doing it. Um, 
And honestly, I even as recently as, you know, 2014, I was kind of hoping that it would um, fade from view, you know. <laughs> and I, I wrote a book about killer whales because I do have this environmental background and I needed something different to write about. And it did very, very well. Actually, it did very, it did much better than any of my books about hate crimes. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it's a very popular book and people still come up to me and say, I love this book, you know, but, uh, <laughs> and I had a lot of fun writing it and, and promoting it and, uh, was, you know, in 2015, it came out in 2015 and I started, you know, I started thinking, well, what's my next book going to be? And I had enjoyed the, Orca book so much that I decided uh, I was going to, uh, I should do a book about humpback whales. And uh, that was my original plan. Uh, my That was definitely my th thinking going into the fall of 2015. Um, that, yeah, I'll, I'll do a book about whales again. And, uh, but then Donald Trump came along and mm -hmm. he really changed my plans because uh, it became obvious that the radical right w wasn't going to go away. And, you know, and one of the things that actually is somewhat heartening to me is that, um, as I say, during, you know, during the preceding years, uh, this uh, specialty of, you know, covering the radical right had really dwindled down to just a handful of us, and most of us are getting pretty old. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 62, so. Um, okay. Um, well, that's not that old. <laughs> no, no, but it's but it's the age where you start going. Oh, I want to slow down a little, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would. I really like not to have to be out in the middle of these riots. I call them shit shows, but uh, <laughs> okay. the, the, that I've been covering for the last couple of years. It's been. I, I think I need combat pay. But. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, you know, I. Uh, was actually kind of hoping to trail off into the sunset. But, and, but it's really heartening to me that, you know, there's a lot of young journalists now that are realizing that this is a serious subject that needs to be treated as a beat, as something right. that you stay on. And, um, uh, and there's a number of them now that are doing it. I'm so I'm very heartened by that. And I, I've made, you know, contacts with a number of them. Um, and, try to do what I can to encourage them because we do need another generation uh, of people who are uh, engaged in this subject because, uh, like I say, some of us are getting a little long in the tooth. So uh, congratulations to, you know, Jared Holt and uh, Kelly Weil and, and folks like that. They're just uh, the next generation of reporters on the speed, I think, are doing a terrific job. Good, good. Yeah, it's it seems like it's not going away, right? No, it's it never goes away. That was, you know, part of my thinking when I started writing about it as a freelancer in the 90s. I went, well, this is an evergreen subject, you know. It's not going mm -hmm. to really fade from view. Although it de definitely became a, an unpopular subject during most of the decade after 9-11. Uh, I had a lot of difficulty selling stories on this subject. Right, right. Everybody was focused on... Uh uh, like Muslims. Islamic, yeah, Islamic yeah. terror, right? <laughs> yep, they really were, and and not only that, Fox News had come to so dominate in the sort of dis the, the 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 landscape of the discourse that uh, bringing the subject up got you immediately accused of uh, you know liberal bias, which, which in my case is really pretty funny. I grew up a Republican in Southern Idaho. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not anymore, but um, mostly because I've been pushed away. Uh, although some of it has, a lot of it has to do with my um, really profound and deep disappointment with the Republican Party in terms of how it responds to um, the challenge, has been responding to the presence of right-wing extremists. Uh, right. Uh, in the past 20 years, it's... Uh, you know, in the, in the early 80s when I was doing this, Republicans understood that uh, right-wing extremists were a threat to them as well as they are to everybody else. Uh, but uh, that recognition has gone away. So It almost, uh, I mean, it almost seems sometimes like the the mainstream right or conserv mainstream conservatism is 
hand in hand with the far right radicals now. Uh, it's definitely um, a symbiotic relationship these days, uh, uh, sort of embodied by Trump, um, where they each help each other um, without ever having or without ever really making the relationship explicit. Um, right. But the yeah, the radical right definitely relies on the uh, sort of empowerment that the uh, mainstream right gives them. And the mainstream right relies on the radical right for um, pulling the, the lever on the discourse, you know, keeping mm. things, uh, keeping the discourse swinging rightward and um, being out there on the fringe for them because uh, it's actually very useful for them to keep the discourse going rightward in that way. And yeah, they, they obviously it uh, brings them a lot of energy, and uh, um, you know, it's there's definitely <laughs> they're definitely enmeshed together, definitely right. enmeshed together in ways that are really quite disturbing. So, how far back does this radical fringe of the right wing uh, go? Well, I mean, some of it you could date. All the way back to the the Klan era, the 1920s. Um, okay, because I mean that's where a lot of this story begins. Ultimately, is that, um, the the Klan of the 20s was a, a national organization that had chapters in every state, and uh, they you know they ran the legislature in states like Indiana and Oregon, um, and uh, it was much wider spread than people have any concept of and it was also much more broadly accepted as a semi-legitimate thing but um you know the basically the uh the hangovers from the leftovers from that period um also formed an organization during the 30s called a the silver shirts um Okay. And some of the leaders and, and participants in the Silver Shirts, which was a neo-Nazi organization that, that went away immediately when we entered World War II. Um, but people from the Silver Shirts, uh, were very, very active in, uh, Southern segregation and, uh, other, uh, early forms of, you know, white supremacist movements and, um, had their own organizations down there. And some of these guys, eventually, uh, a particularly a guy named William Potter Gale, uh, wound up devising a, a movement called Posse Comitatus. And Posse Comitatus was re it was this organization in that came up in the seventies and eighties, a uh, very far right, anti-Semitic, profoundly white supremacist um, organization that. Um, had a real violent streak. Uh, they were responsible for a number of uh, murders and uh, uh, that sort of thing. But they were really mostly uh, recruited in rural areas. Okay. And their ideology is what gave birth, essentially, to the militia movement of the 90s. It was, um, you know, this extreme radicalism. It's a lot of the stuff that you hear from the Clive and Bundy folks oh, now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the idea that the sheriff is the supreme law of the land, the idea that uh, the federal government doesn't uh, can't actually own uh, public land. Um, right. All of these, uh, these they call themselves constitutionalists, uh, but it's this really bizarre, very anti-Semitic and racist interpretation of the Constitution. <laughs> um, it was picked up by a Mormon fellow named uh, Cleon Skousen, who got heavily promoted, you may recall, by Glenn Beck, uh, right. and back on his show. Um, Skousen was basically somebody who, uh, took the Posse Comitatus ideology and, and sort of scrubbed it of its, uh, overt anti-Semitic and racist elements and, um, sort of created this ideology that is what we call the Patriot Movement now. <laughs> so, um, I began Alt America really in the nineties. When the the militia movement um, started forming, because that was for me when I really started seeing this um, 
see them forming this epistemological bubble uh, okay. that they build for themselves, this alternative universe where, you know, it's comprised of conspiracy f- theories and mm-hmm. alternative facts. <laughs> and they, um, and it's, yeah, it, it re- I started seeing this in the 90s with the, around the militia movement that they were able to operate in their own little alternative universe. And um, it just kept building uh, through, you know, the, through the first decade of the, two, uh, the 21st century, uh, especially in, in the form of the 9-11 truther movement. Um, and, uh, you know, the whole paranoia about um, New World Order, that sort of thing. And... Uh, it uh, really didn't gain traction until Barack Obama won election, and then mm. it then it all coalesced um, under the banner of the Tea Party, and this opposition to Obama uh, coalesced with the the conspiratorial militia element, and pretty soon we were seeing uh, old style militia ideology just flowing right into the mainstream in Fox News and elsewhere. So um yeah that was that was sort of the origins of alt america this alternative right. this alternative universe they've created for themselves uh was yeah these patriot the patriot militia folks that was where you know Alex Jones got his start okay and, yeah and in many ways uh, Alex Jones is is sort of the the uh one of the central figures in alt america because he's he more than any other person has has done more to create uh, this alternative universe for them. Right, right. You uh, in your book, you kind of mention uh, that some of these patriot movements or these uh, militias they weren't a big fan of like George W. Bush at the time, huh. and they weren't really on board with the uh, the mainstream conservatism. No, that's right. Well, that, and that's why mainstream conservatives uh, were stayed away from the the conspiratorial element as well, uh, because you know, I mean, the nine eleven conspiracy theory was that George W. Bush was mm-hmm. uh, one of the leaders of the New World Order and was taking people down this path, um, and that he was one of the nefarious conspirators. So, of course, um, you know, when if somebody like Rush Limbaugh uh got asked about it uh they viciously attacked the conspiracists uh, <laughs> right. during during the bush years and um uh, but it when once obama was elected um pretty much any conspiracy was fair game and obviously the one they they went and ran with the birther conspiracy theory uh, right uh, yeah <laughs> was was one that uh you know had some legs uh, even though it, it had absolutely, absolutely no grounding in fact or reality. It was yeah. such a bizarre thing. The, uh, is, is that part of why these, uh, far right conspiracists like Donald Trump is because of the connection he had to that birther movement? Um, I, or I was think it everything. <laughs> well, no, it was, I mean, that was how he first got their attention and how he first got cred with them was, yeah, I mean, he, he built his career back in 2011. He started, he did all this stuff with the like birther conspiracy and, uh, you know, and got humiliated at the White House correspondence dinner by Barack Obama <laughs> over it. That was and, classic. <laughs> well, and a lot of people think that that was the moment when he decided to run. Is that right? Yeah. And yeah. The, the evidence kind of suggests that, too, because he definitely began building his uh, political resume uh, shortly mm-hmm. after that and and establishing the sort of uh, political context that he, he needed to, to make the run. So, um, and certainly all during the years after 2011, he continued to... Um, uh, promote that conspiracy theory. He and Joe Arpaio were hand in glove there for a while. Uh, and the, Arpaio did the investigation of, uh, of Obama's birth certificate, you know, that, that he, he claimed proved that he was not born in the United States. Right. It was all extremely, it, it was beyond dubious evidence. It was just the flimsiest crap you've ever seen. So, um, 
but uh, really, even up until, even right at the moment he announced, you know, in June 2015, or was it July? Yeah, I think it was July. Um, uh, right up to the that moment, he nobody really paid any attention to him. Right. And uh, but the announcement caught everybody's attention, particularly among the white nationalists, mainly because not just was he, he already a conspiracist, uh, but he also but then he was spouting all this stuff about immigrants. And that really caught their attention. And the moment when they all got in line behind Donald Trump was when uh, he released his uh, immigration plan that right. au- that August. Um, that immigration plan, you recall, called for deporting all 12 million uh, <laughs> undocumented Im- immigrants and... Uh, uh, among other things. And, and it was, you know, re- it was basically the white nationalist immigration plan come true. It was, it's right. what, it was what exactly white nationalists had been advocating for for a long time. So uh, they all jumped on his bandwagon. Uh, the immigration plan was really the key moment for Trump. And, uh, that's when they all jumped on, on board. And, uh, it was that moment when he, his campaign actually also uh, obtained momentum. Hmm. Is there something that triggered the like the resurgence that we're seeing now? Well, no, beyond, I, Don, uh, beyond Donald, Donald Trump, I mean. Well, I I really believe that the uh, um, the underlying uh, phenomenon here is authoritarianism. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and I think authoritarianism has been uh, rising within the Republican Party for a long time, uh, and especially, I would say, after nine eleven. Nine eleven is when we really started seeing uh, this kind of authoritarianism. I mean, even though the the mainstream Republicans uh, avoided the conspiracism of during the Bush years, uh, avoided. Avoided uh, jumping into the conspiracy theory bandwagons, that sort of thing. Um, we, you know, at the same time, he was um, there. There was really this powerful surge of authoritarianism mm-hmm. during those years, particularly in response to any kind of uh, liberal criticism of George Bush. Uh, you recall, you know, that liberals were accused of, why do you hate America? Why do you, why are you soft on terrorism? And that sort of thing. If, if they, right. if they criticized the handling of the war. And that, um, authoritarianism became really intense during those years. So it really, once it got wedded to the conspiracism, when, uh, Barack Obama, uh, took off, then it became really, um, sort of classic uh, right-wing authoritarianism in the sense that it, it was very prone to um, not just conspiracy theories, but also highly tolerant of um, uh, bigoted behavior right. and bigoted attitudes, that sort of thing. So um, that was, uh, I, I think, really key. And authoritarianism is a very particular phenomenon. Um what it essentially means is, I mean, everyone thinks of authoritarianism in terms of the guy who's on top. That right. and they sort of had this concept that authoritarianism is imposed on us from from the top down, but it's actually not. Authoritarianism is always empowered by a large segment of the population that prefers to have an authoritarian leader, and of course, right. you only need to look at. Brazil to see a recent example of this, um, right? But um, but the United States has always, you know, we've always had this uh, authoritarianism, right wing authoritarianism, latent in in sort of the national psyche, and uh, Trump very much tapped into it, and he's very much playing on it. I mean, authoritarianism is the reason why uh, he can shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and they won't change their attitudes, right? Right, right. Uh, and literally, uh, he can do all this stuff that he's been doing in the past week, uh, blaming the victims 
for the terrorism against right, them. Right, yeah. And and they all back him for it. There nobody nobody on his side sees anything wrong with that. Hmm. I, uh, just to maybe touch on some of the stuff that's been coming up this uh this last week or whatever. Like a lot of people seemed surprised that there was pipe bombs being sent to uh democrats and democrat supporters and uh <laughs> to the point where like even leftists that i know wondered if maybe this these things were fake yeah until the they finally arrested somebody i wonder like was this not all just kind of par for the course for the far right like i thought this seemed right in line with the way they behaved in the past uh, yeah, no, those of us who've tracked far right, of course, are anything but surprised, particularly given, given the, uh, sort of rhetorical hysteria that's been building in the last few weeks. Um, and, and that's usually when we start seeing, uh, people popping out and acting out, uh, in this violent fashion. Uh, it, you know, essentially the pressure, uh, builds to an intense level and, these people just pop off yeah uh eventually and um you know it's you know i've been saying it's inevitable for a very long time i've been getting called an alarmist as a result so um <laughs> i just have to shrug it off because you know i i know what i know um, right but yeah no i've been dismissed for a very long time because uh, folks were saying oh these things aren't this bad. They, they're, they're not that crazy, are they? <laughs> you have no idea. You have no idea how crazy they are. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, and this is one of the things that still gets me about liberals because they want to continue believing that things are normal still. And they want, <laughs> they want to believe that these guys, you know, at the end, you can still reach out across the aisle and have a normal democratic discourse <laughs> with the other side. And, and I hate to tell them, but, uh, it, it, we've gone past that. Uh, we right. are long past that because th- the American right so deeply and viscerally loathes um, liberals in this country, right? Uh, that they will that they obviously have no intent of ever sharing power with them again. I mean, that became obvious during the Obama years, yeah. And you know the treatment that he got, and, you know, was sort of the apotheosis of that was the Merrill Garland. Or Merrick Garland uh, oh, nomination. Yeah. Um, so it's not just, a, but it's not just on a political level. It's actually on this very personal level, uh, where people, uh, you know, people who are, have been deeply propagandized by the right wing hate machine, um, simply would rather kill us all. They really would, and I don't, and I'm not exaggerating. Uh, they yeah. really, they really would rather just like to see us all drop off the face of the earth and um, and they're constantly fantasizing about what they get to do when the civil war finally breaks out. Um, right. People don't understand how deep that deeply embedded that hostility is and how deeply they hate us. And uh, I don't know that there's any immediate solution to it other than, I mean, eventually what has to happen if we're ever going to, uh, solve this if we're ever going to get away from um, this constant civil uh, strive. It, one of the things that has to happen is we have to dismantle right wing media. Um, mm-hmm. We can't. You can't have a cohesive nation when you have a cable channel uh, that coaches half the country to hate the other half. Uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Just yeah. can't happen. Not going to happen. Uh, and that's what's been happening for the last 15 years. Fox News has been coaching Americans to hate other, the re- liberal Americans for at least 15 years, if not more. And um, you know what? It worked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The... I, I'm reminded of a, a documentary I watched not long ago, The Brainwashing of My Dad. Yeah, oh yeah, great movie. Yeah, about uh, uh, the subject uh, or the documentary filmmaker's dad started off as a Democrat and watched Fox News and listened to Rush Limbaugh and turned into like uh, 
a far right <laughs> guy, just angry person who uh, who just yeah like could not live with liberals or listen to anything that liberals would say. Yeah, no. Um, well, it's it's really been terrible for a lot of family relationships and personal relationships. Um, you know, and, and it, uh, it and of course it depends on how far down the rabbit hole they've gone. Right. Um, people who go down the the Infowars Alex Jones rabbit hole um, become really uh, deeply entrenched in a way that becomes impossible to have a relationship. I. I just had, we had a case out here that I uh, have been covering uh, here in Northwest Washington with a guy who was all involved in uh, the Gamergate and Pizzagate controversies. His name is uh, mm. Lane Davis. He was a, he went by the nom de plume Seattle for Truth and made these videos that were very popular among the Gamergate crowd. And he oh, was do, doing the same with Pizzagate. Well, he lived in his parents' basement out here and on Samish Island, not far from where I'm at right now. <laughs> and uh, last summer, I got in, into an argument with his father, who was, uh, you know, a typical um, middle-of-the-road Democrat. Right. Uh, accused his father of being, you know, part of the pedophilia ring that is the whole oh, myth, mythos of Pizzagate. And dad said, you know, I'm, I'm done with it. You're, you're out of here. You're moving out of the basement. You're not going to live with us anymore if you're going to say this kind of stuff. For sure. He picked up a kitchen knife and stabbed his father three times in the chest oh, and killed geez. him. Oh, jeez. So um, that's what happens. People get so lost. And, and you know, and the, and the conspiracism is, is so deeply unhinging. Um, I feel quite confident that the Las Vegas shooter, mm -hmm. um, uh, Stephen Paddock, was uh had gone down these same rabbit holes and the his mm -hmm. belief in conspiracy theories is what motivated him to murder all those people in las vegas last october and, and I, I had a niece in that crowd oh geez yeah so it was uh you know people think that this stuff isn't going to touch them but it does and it's going to touch you eventually just like it touched the people in pittsburgh this week yeah i uh what do you think of like I've heard a lot of people who characterize these individuals as just one crazy person. Yeah. Isolated wonder, incidents. <laughs> right. Lone I wonder, wolves. Like, yeah. Lone wolves. Well, so the, and of course that's the phrase you often hear is, that, Oh, he's just a lone wolf. Right. Right. Uh, but the problem is that when, when people uh, throw that out there, they don't understand that, that lone wolf strategy is actually a, a, a discrete strategy by the designed by the radical right uh, back in the late 80s a guy named Louis Beam who was part of the Aryan Nations came up with this idea you know it's leaderless <laughs> resistance and there are two ways okay. two ways you can do leaderless resistance one is form militia cells which is help was the basis of one of the core ideas of the militia movement in the 90s and uh, the other is to uh, engage in lone wolf attacks. Right. Um, and so uh, attacking, th there was actually a book written by William Pierce, uh, the man who wrote the Turner Diaries. Turner Diaries was the book that inspired the Order, uh, Timothy McVeigh, and a bunch of other radical right-wing extremists. It was essentially a neo-Nazi blueprint for uh, white uh, supremacist uh, oh, terror, okay. terrorist revolution and overthrow of the government um, and has has a long and notorious history. Uh, the guy who wrote it, his name is William Pierce. He ran an organization called National Alliance, which was one of the major neo-Nazi organizations in the States until he died in, I think, 2001. And um, they, you know, he, well, Pierce also wrote a book uh, called Hunter. Um, there was sort of a sequel to Turner Diaries, and it described um, a, a lone wolf going out and, and murdering, uh, you know, assassinating uh, lots of people, um, and sort of described his career. Well, that that book actually did inspire 
uh, one lone wolf killer, a guy named Joseph Paul Franklin, who uh, murdered uh, multi uh, mixed race couples, and uh, mm -hmm. he shot J Vernon Jordan, tried to assassinate Vernon Jordan, um, and a bunch of people finally got caught in I think what was it ninety eight, um, and uh, but he you know the hmm. the idea of lone wolf strategy that it's something independent from that it's like disattached from this movement right. is, is actually really laughable because this movement actually devised uh, lone wolf attacks as a specific strategy for yeah. uh, terrorizing um, what they call Zog, the Zionist <laughs> occupied government. Oh, geez. So, so I guess something I was curious about is, uh, I mean, it seems to me that the comparison to left-wing violence is a, a narrative that is promoted by the right. But I wonder, from somebody, from your perspective, uh, how does right-wing violence compare to left-wing violence in, in North America? Or broader, if you have an idea there. Well, um, I, I'm not a fan of anti-fascists, uh, although I consider myself, I mean... Philosophically <laughs> speaking, I am anti-fascist, but um, the the black bloc folks who've been showing up at these demonstrations, um, I'm not a fan of what they do. Partly because you know I've been assaulted by them. <laughs> oh, Jesus! Uh, just you know, if you carry a camera around, they don't want you taking pictures. And uh, yeah, I've been whacked several times. Um, and so yeah, it's uh, uh, not only that. My my general observation of most anti-fascists is that they are um, um, basically anti-democratic anyway. They don't believe in democracy, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, uh, and really, in a lot of ways, they're they're just left-wing authoritarians as well. So. Um, I, I, I'm not a fan of what they do. I'm a, I'm a small D Democrat. I believe in democracy, and I believe you know that the answer to this is a democratic response, peaceful one, nonviolent response. Um, I do understand the need uh, for communities, uh, particularly vulnerable uh, minorities, to be defended, and right. for communities to defend them. And um, I you know I'm, I strongly support uh, self defense. Right. But um, there's a lot of these guys showing up to these things that are itching to fight. Um, right. And mm -hmm. and so I'm, I'm not a, a big fan of this. Not only that, I also believe that um, I also know from history that that Nazis have a long, long history. Fascists have a history of of leveraging left wing violence as a propaganda uh, right tool to it's basically they want the violence there and so what we've been seeing at these uh, right wing demonstrations on the west coast is these guys coming in uh, with a bunch of street brawlers uh, from outside these cities uh, quite often they're from rural or ex-urban areas uh, and they hate urban dwellers uh, and they hate liberals. And so they're coming to these cities, um, particularly the Patriot Prayer and Proud Boys types. Um, right. They're coming to these cities and deliberately trying to provoke confrontations. And um, unfortunately, and, you know, and they're doing it so that they can have this propaganda point claiming that the left is violent. And once they achieve that, that, uh, consensus on that, what that does is it actually gives them permission to engage in an open campaign of violence. So it's extremely mm. dangerous um, to allow that sort of uh, that talking point to, to progress. And unfortunately, we have mainstream media that are all too willing to help them. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Was, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to ask you too, like, what do you think of the mainstream media's coverage of uh, this right wing violence or this radical right? Oh, it's been um, it's been pathetic. That uh, it's been a, a lot of oh, gee, both sides are doing it stuff. And you know, I've been in the middle of these things. 
And trust me, it's not both sides doing it. Uh, the right is coming into these cities, deliberately provoking violence, uh, creating scenes uh, uh, that are intended to uh, uh, create, you know, create violence. And, right. And um, and then there's, you know, and then they're celebrating it when, you know, they get in a good punch. You know, Gavin McInnes must have played that uh, shot of... Uh, the Proud Boy punching that anti-fascist uh, in Portland on June thirtieth. He must have played that clip about eight hundred times, you know. Yeah. So, uh, so they're celebrating the violence, and and they definitely are uh, part of you know that, and that's part of the fascist mentality is this uh, cult of violence. So, yeah, I, I'm not a fan of the anti-fascists. Um, <laughs> I also think that they. Um, Aren't you know they're they're not strategic strategically or tactically very smart I don't think uh, because I think that the uh, the violence is what these guys want. That said, um, I'm frankly glad that somebody is out there uh, to stand up to these guys because right. the, the reason the anti fascists are out there is that mainstream liberals don't take this stuff seriously. They don't right. think it affects them. They don't think until somebody walks into a synagogue that this stuff is going to affect them. You know, the largest crowd we had in Portland was the Patriot Prayer um, event that happened a week after the Portland Max stabbings mm. uh, by a mem- by a guy who had been attending Patriot Prayer rallies, and um, the that crowd was massive. There must have been two, three thousand people out there on the streets that day. And it was, and that was the kind of demonstration that you wanted to see where people are basically out there in mass numbers saying, no, you're not going to do this in our community. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, they, they've they been utterly absent uh, and for most uh, periods since then. And they basically ceded the field to the far left. And so... Um, you know, the far left is out there uh, having fights with them, partly because there aren't enough mainstream liberals out there um, standing up and saying no. And so I think that, you know, yeah. p- before people start second guessing the anti-fascists, uh, they need to actually put have some skin in the game themselves. Right, right. Um, yeah, I, I think it's been very disappointing uh, how... How half baked the response from mainstream liberals has been. Uh, I think we want to keep pretending to ourselves that the world's still normal. I think right. they, we want to keep pretending that that oh yeah we can we can still uh, have this uh, normal world. No, the world's not normal right now, and no it won't kidding. be for a long time and until we put our shoulders to the wheel and fix this stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I I wonder like is there some aversion to like if if everybody who goes out and and does resistance work uh, against the right gets labeled a far right or far leftist or whatever. Yeah. Is there you, you find there's a lot of resistance to that, you think? Oh no, I mean I get labeled far left all the time <laughs> just by just by working for SPLC. Right. Yeah. Actually, um, yeah. A lot of people label them as far leftist, which is pretty funny. If you actually <laughs> knew the organization, we're, we're very, very um, middle of the road, but right, we're, we're very establishment. But um, yeah, no. All you have to do is criticize these guys. I mean, the, the SPLC got labeled far left because we started listing uh, anti-LGBT groups as hate groups. Mm. Uh, and this, it meant that groups like Family Research Council and Alliance Defending Freedom got listed as hate groups. And, uh, you know, <laughs> well, I guess, <laughs> you know, well, it is what it is, right? Yeah, that's right. If the shoe fits, <laughs> if, if the shoe fits, wear it. And these guys, uh, just keep trying to take that shoe off and throw it at us. <laughs> <laughs> right. But yeah. it, but it is what it is, uh, you know, and these groups are hate groups. I'm sorry. But, yeah. but yeah, and that's how it happens, of course. All you have to do is be anything but uh, 100% right wing, and you get accused of being a liberal. Yeah. <laughs> and 
and in it seems from the right's perspective, liberals, leftists, uh, communists, anarchists, they're all the same. They're all the same thing. Yeah, yeah. No, a socialist equals a communist. Well, and of course, if you listen to uh, Dinesh D'Souza, a Nazi equals a socialist, right? right, right yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the one that cracks me up. I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. having been somebody who, you know, covered the area of nations in uh, real time in the 70s and 80s, the idea that th- those people are, are leftists is just, it gives me a big old belly laugh. Let me tell you. That. <laughs> yeah. just, I like cow. the, uh, I like the joke, like people who think that the Nazis were socialists yeah. must be really confused by buffalo wings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 No. Yeah. Well, they're the same people that say, well, this is a democ, this is a republic, not a democracy. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. does that mean we're like the, a republic of or the socialist socialist republics or or maybe the people's uh, democratic republic of north korea or maybe the people's right. republic of china is that the kind yeah. of republic we are <laughs> yeah, that's right. yeah uh you know yeah no we're uh you know th- but that's the thing they th- they buy into this worldview and boy it's really hard to get people out once they're down that hole right eh do you do you have any insight as to how one might or how we as a group could maybe pull people out of that? I don't know of I mean the biggest thing uh, honestly is to turn turn off the tap. Uh I, I think the biggest help for cutting down on Alex Jones style conspiracism has been the fact that he's lost his platform. Right. Uh, the fact that he can't spread this crap on on YouTube anymore is actually a huge step for fighting this but we're never going to fight it until we also uh get rid of fox news and we you know i think we need to revive journalistic standards in general Mm -hmm. uh they become horribly degraded in the last 20 years and uh, i think there needs to be a revival of journalistic standards as well um and that would include obviously i mean you don't necessarily need to put Fox News out of business, you just have to make them be not a propaganda station. Right. You know, right. it's one thing to have a, a sort of right leaning editorial policy. It's another thing to just blatantly broadcast false information. Yeah. Um, it, and that's what Fox is, does. Is there, uh, I, I have heard theories in the past about uh, tying this sort of rise of the right wing media to, uh, the elimination of the fairness doctrine. I wonder if there's yeah. something to that. Yeah, definitely. Well, it definitely started happening. I absolutely was uh, elimination of the fairness doctrine uh, opened the door for people like Rush Limbaugh. Uh, mm. And uh, not only that, it opened the door for all these radio stations all around the country whose ownerships were typically very right wing to make their radio stations right wing uh, because then they no longer had to, um, they no longer had to do the, you know, fairness stuff. <laughs> uh, they didn't have to balance their, their coverage. And um, so fairness, doc- the loss of the fairness doctrine definitely opened the door. I'm not entirely sure that uh, reinstating, the fairness doctrine was problematic. Mm. Um, I think if we're going to talk about reinstating the fairness doctrine, uh, it has to be as reformed as well. I mean, it has to be a, a, uh, a modified yeah. fairness doctrine. Uh, but yeah, I think we ne- definitely need to do something like that. I actually think what the, the real core, uh, is corporate ownership at the bottom mm-hmm. line. I, when I was working in newspapers and in the early, in the late seventies and early eighties, you know, it was fairly common for people for the, especially for these community papers. You know, if somebody invested in them, it was like investing in bonds. You got a good seven right. to eight percent annual return. Very, very steady, very reliable kind of investment. Uh, but it didn't make you a lot of money, right? Mm-hmm. But it was, but like I say, it was a, it was a steady sort of investment and ha- had its place in the market because of that. Once they get bought by uh, corporations, um, all the newspapers I worked at suddenly had to start uh, making profit margins in the 15% range, 15 right. to 20, because that was what the stockholders expected. 
So in order to reach those goals, um, they started cutting budgets. And of course, the first things to get cut are um, investigative reporters and consumer <laughs> reporters, because those are the guys who embarrass the publisher. Um, and, and that's just, that's just the nature of the beast. So, um, and, and I think that that was the beginning of the downfall of community journalism in America. I think the fact that they, that corporations came in and basically gutted, uh, thousands of small community dailies and turned them into shell operations that barely made money is a lot of the reasons mm. that, that journalism keeled over because, um, these papers weren't serving their communities any longer. So, um, uh, I don't know that yeah. you necessarily need to ban corporate ownership, but what I do think we could do is require, basically set a requirement that if you're in, involved in the news business, uh, you can't make any more than 10% profit. And, uh, if you make any more than 10% profit, you have to plow it back into your operation. You know, right. yeah, <laughs> and 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 that would actually drive most of the corporate types out of the media business and get us <laughs> right. back to get us back to. Well, seriously, this is the media. The press is supposed to be one of the four pillars of American democracy. It's the fourth estate. It's one of the it, it's one of the it's a, a, a key democratic institution. And yeah. to to make it utterly dependent on uh, profits um is just a travesty it's a, an atrocity uh it means that what it means is that the press is no longer working as a democratic institution uh guarding our information but it means that they're all in a race to the bottom uh, doggy dog world where uh you know it's all about getting eyeballs <laughs> uh, right, right. so that just means you're going to have the most sensational stuff uh, you won't have any, nobody's going to report on city councils anymore. And, uh, it's going to totally destroy the fabric of communities. Uh, you know, that's, that's essentially where corporate ownership leads us. And I think at the end, uh, that's one of the things we have to do. So those are the sort of structural things I think we need to do to make a change. Okay. Um, uh, those are a little further down the road. A lot of this stuff comes down to how we behave around each other. Um, you know, a lot of it has to do with our ability to, uh, I mean, keep our heads up, uh, in the midst of this deluge of crap. And, <laughs> and it, it falls, um, being able to, uh, recognize the need to, uh, you know, join arms and be part of a community. Um, you know, the, the Maori, uh, in New Zealand, uh, have a phrase, um, they call, they say kiakaha, which roughly translated stands means be strong. This is a credo for them. But it, the, the, the kiakaha isn't just a be strong by yourself. The idea, the Maori idea of strength is for everyone in the tribe, for everyone to uh, join arms together and to be strong, to be one as a united people. That's what kiakaha means. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to join arms as a community. And that's how I, that's what I ultimately see as our answer to this. Okay. That, that we have to, um, you know, uh, People on the left, people who are not part of the right, a they have to get over the 2016 election and the Bernie stuff and all the all the fighting, the internal internecine bickering that has um, happened within the liberal world has to be forgotten because we're we're confronted with an existential threat in the form of this proto-fascist, right? And if we don't uh, if we don't stop it, uh, we're all we're all dead. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's, it's not going to end well. <laughs> no, no, it's not going to end well. That almost seems like a really good place to end it, but I have a question, another okay, question sure. on my sheet. <laughs> sure. So I wanted to ask uh, what you think uh, the impact of the internet culture has been on the rise of the radical right. 
Well, I, I think the Internet experience has a lot to do. You know, the, the nature of the Internet has a lot to do with how and why we're in this state. Because the Internet is the, the sort of in, uh, exchanges, the interpersonal exchanges you have on the Internet are uh, the simulacrum of actual human interaction. It's not, I mean, it feels like you're actually talking with somebody. Right. Uh, but you're actually just exchanging bits on a computer screen. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and this is why it's very easy. Well, it's, I mean, this is part of, of course, why, you know, misunderstandings occur all the time on the internet. You know, it's very easy to miscommunicate your intent because you know, you don't have, there's no intonation, there's no eye contact, there's no hand gestures, there's not a physical body there right. for you to interact with. All you have is these words on a screen, right? But th that also makes it extremely easy to dehumanize other yeah. people. And the dehumanization is really key because, you know, and that's, of course, the uh, source of trolling culture and that sort of thing. Very common right. on the internet, but also, um, the, you know, the, the dehumanization is also really, is, is really essential to right wing extremism. I mean, in all my years of dealing with right wing extremist ideology, I would say the, the one underlying common factor that runs through all of it is a profound, um, not just lack of empathy, but uh, antagonism towards empathy and towards right, right. It, it's, it's profoundly anti-empathetic, right? Yeah. And and empathy, of course, the, you know, this is why, so this is why you get psychopaths and sociopaths attracted to these movements because right. that's the essence of what makes you sociopathic is that lack of empathy, right? Yeah. So naturally, you're going to have a very large number of sociopathic, narcissistic, psychopathic uh, personalities being attracted to this, uh, being part of this movement, and not just uh, being part of it, but actually driving it, setting its agenda, creating its talking points. It's that facts over feels yeah. uh, meme like Ben Shapiro likes to use. Yeah, yeah. And if only he actually dealt with facts. You know, that's the problem is they, 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 have, <laughs> yeah. they, they really believe they have their own facts. It's kind of bizarre. Yeah. Um, uh, but their facts are actually a factual. That's the bizarre part about it. Right, eh? So they lack empathy and they don't have the right facts. <laughs> well, or they have their alternative facts. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. That's what, that, and that's what they run off of. Yeah. It's, it's lack of empathy and this uh, sort of alternative universe that gets built up around it. Uh, and, um, it's really a toxic combination. Yeah. Uh, I guess, I guess that's as good a place as any to stop. Uh, okay. I, I guess where can people find your work, uh, or more stuff from you? <laughs> well, um, I write for the, uh, hate watch blog of the Southern poverty law center. So, uh, you can go there and find my work there. Um, I do have, you know, a Twitter account under my name that's uh, turned out to be quite popular. Um, and um, I freelance a lot. I've got a piece coming up in The Baffler and, and that sort okay. of thing. But but the main place is, yeah, the Hate Watch blog. Uh, that's where you can find my work. And, of course, uh, the uh, books that I write. I mean, uh, Alt America is my eighth book. Um, I have been warning about this quite a while. I wrote a book in 2009 called The Eliminationists that basically predicted that this was going to happen. Okay. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it has. So, you know, I, yeah. I, I really hate being right, actually. Yeah, uh, this is one of the worst things to be right about. It really is. Um, I, I would just as soon uh, be proven to have been an alarmist uh, who was out on a limb, but um, no, I was unfortunately proved to. All this stuff. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty, you know, it's disheartening. Of course, uh, I feel like Cassandra, the you know the the mythical prophet, <laughs> right. the, the poor woman in the uh, in the myth who in the, uh, 
Trojan War myth who predicted all of those uh, horrible outcomes and even tried to warn them against bringing in the Trojan horse. Right. But, uh, she she was cursed with... Uh, she, her curse was that she would have the gift of prophecy and no one would believe her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I've, I've, I definitely have had a little bit of Cassandra syndrome going. <laughs> right. But, uh, yeah. Um, you know, uh, all I can say is everybody get out and vote uh, and uh, let's do the right thing. Kia kaha. Yeah. Kia kaha. Yeah. You know? I... Uh, I will. I'm going to rush through the processing of this episode as fast as I can so okay. that I can get this out quick. Um, I will also, what I like to do when I have authors on is I like to offer the first listener to email me that I will buy them a copy of the book. So I will do that again. Okay. And That's then, uh, yeah, I guess follow you on Twitter. And <laughs> yeah. Keep an eye on the far right. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, let's just, uh, Let's all be in this together. Uh, we we got to stop fighting amongst ourselves. So awesome! Well, thank you for joining me, and uh, yeah, have a good one. All right, thanks for having me on. You bet. We'll talk to you later. You bet. Bye bye. Bye. Have you heard the Habeas Humor podcast? It's a new legal show with lots of thoughtful analysis. That must have been like a desert fart of dry excitement. Famous politicians, or at least people who went to school with them. And then she says, have you met Barack Obama? And I'm asked, who the heck is Shaka Lama? And legal tips. You can still be rapey if your dick doesn't work the more you know. Disney can't sue me if I don't sing it. H-A-B-E-A-S-H-U-M-O-R. That's it for this episode of The Skeptic Studio. I hope you enjoyed it. For anything else, you can contact me at mail at brainstormblog.net. You can find links to David's content in the show notes or by following him on Twitter at David Nywart. You can follow the show on Twitter at BrainstormPod, check out the Facebook page at facebook.com slash brainstormpodcast, or join our Facebook group. Search for the Brainstorm Podcast Discussion Group. Or you can follow me on Twitter at Hardcore Skeptic. Thanks to our financial supporters, Kayla, Janet, Kim, Stephanie, Zach, the Utah Outcasts, Will, Aaron, Daryl, Destin Sucks, Bob Glenn, Destin Doesn't Suck That Much, Magnus, several species of small furry animals gathered together in a cave, Positively Skeptical, Rob, the Bodong Polymath, the Flying Spaghetti Monster, Sauce Be Upon Him, Freethinker215, and Larry. If you want to help, want to join them and help the show grow, then you can do that at patreon.com slash brainstormpodcast. Thanks to Dave Roman from Empire, from Roman Empire Studios for our intro music. Thanks to Aaron Rabbi from the Embrace the Void podcast for doing the voiceover for it. Thanks to Alex Capper Murdoch for doing the voiceover for our ad. And thanks to Jason Camo for our outro music. You can find all the respective links to those fine folks on the, in the show notes on brainstormblog.net. Make sure to follow the show on Spreaker for notifications whenever a new episode is up or we go live. That's brainstormradio.net. Make sure to check out our new store online for some brainstorm gear. It's at tpublic.com slash stores slash brainstorm dash podcast dash gear. Give us a rating, a thumbs up, or a fave on your podcatcher of choice. Join our Facebook group, like our page, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to the subreddit, sign up for our newsletter, share the show, and spread the word. The more you share, comment, and like our stuff, the more it helps the show grow. Thanks for listening, and remember, the truth matters. This is an opinion-based podcast. Each person on the podcast is responsible for their own opinions, and those opinions don't necessarily reflect the views of the rest of the panel. Any guests or anyone associated with the people on the podcast, such as spouses, partners, children, other family members, friends, or employers. No one person speaks for the podcast, with the possible exception of Corey, and he doesn't speak for anyone else on the show. The Brainstorm podcast does not represent the views of our sponsors.